she broke into tears and started crying, telling me about her story and how she has these seizures and episodes of basically an inability to speak and find words. Many times she would be at work and this would happen in front of other people. So it was, you know, a tremendous source of embarrassment for her. And basically this kind of thing would happen and people would have to hook up uh, an oxygen tank that she had just in order to calm the, the seizures and convulsing down. And, you know, these episodes would happen, you know, once or twice a week and they would wipe her out energy-wise for days at a time. And even a couple times a year, they would result in, in more like grand mal type seizures. This significantly affected her lifestyle. She was having to be dependent on, you know, using this oxygen for a better part of the day oftentimes. And, of course, exhaustion is a huge part of this, um, some pain and, and, and muscular cramping that went with it. So I asked her, I said, you know, how long had this been going on? You know, what started this? Where did this, where did this kind of strange thing come from? And she told me that her, you know, her physician's, really couldn't figure out what was going on. The one thing that they, they did that was helpful was prescribe this oxygen. So that was sort of her saving grace, but also kind of her um, her burden to carry this around and bring it with her. You know, and it's a source of embarrassment. It, it affected her work. She wasn't able to, to work much anymore. So I said, you know, how did this start? Where did this come from? You know, let, let's hear a bit about your story. And, you know, a very nice lady had um, lived on the East Coast for the majority of her life. Very, very nice life. She was a business owner two children, married. She said she's just started gradually getting sick. Kind of strange things, a lot of chronic fatigue, allergies. Her kids would get allergies. And this, over time, started to basically affect her ability to run her business. It started causing family problems, problems in her marriage. She did end up getting a divorce and eventually moved to um, Colorado because that's where her family was no longer able to support herself out there without being able to run her business, uh, you know, getting divorced, so moved closer to family. About that time, getting out here, higher elevation, these seizure-like episodes began to start. Along with this, she was starting to have um, gastrointestinal type problems and kind of running the gauntlet of what medicine had to offer just, and just looking for answers, um, which, you know, coming from somebody who had been running a business you know, a successful woman who's been uh, taking care of herself, taking care of her kids, and now basically unable to do this. So, you know, it was very, very difficult for her, and she felt, you know, a tremendous amount of shame over this. And then while out hiking, you know, getting up to higher elevations, um, the first seizure episode happened. And basically, if, she, you know, she was with friends and family who were basically able to carry her down this mountain, some she believed that you know had they not been there she very likely may not have survived so she lived like this for several years basically being unable to carry on we decided to approach it from a very gentle standpoint gave her a uh, basic tea to help rid the body gently of pathogens molds and basically start helping boost her energy up a little bit and i taught her a little bit about some breathing exercises things that can um help improve oxygen in the body and increase blood flow into the brain. I would have her follow up with me, but it wasn't until about week three or week four, she's drinking the tea, doing the exercises, and she says, you know, it's been a week and I haven't had to use my oxygen. And, you know, she, she looked at me and I can just see her staring at in my eyes and I see the tears just start to form in her face. I said, well, that's great. She says, I can't believe this, you know? So we didn't really change anything. I said, okay, you know, we're on the right track. Let's, let's keep moving forward. Three, four weeks go by and she says, my energy's back. I haven't felt this good in years. She was able to start working more again and it completely changed her life. In, in the subsequent weeks and months to come, it was just very interesting to see the difference that this made in her lifestyle you know going from you know being basically exhausted all the time dependent on a on a machine to deliver oxygen to being able to go out hiking spending extra time uh, with their children and then eventually being able to get back out and um, start dating again this was a very big deal to her because being sick like this was she believed 
a major reason why her marriage failed. And this was a great source of shame and fear for her. So the ability to get out there and start meeting other people, making new friends, start dating again, this was like a pivotal turning point for her because now she's working again. She's supporting her family. She's able to find friendship and love again. Basically, this whole process was absolutely life-changing for her. And um, to see that, to see the, the amount of gratitude that somebody can have again for their life and to regain what they've lost, you know, to come full circle through a battle like that uh, is incredibly inspiring and uh, incredibly moving to, to watch this. This touching story has important lessons to teach us about gut health, energy levels, and neural optimization. Mold exposure can come on damp drafts. As the mold toxins make contact with the skin, it will cause your sodium potassium pumps to break down. The mold wants this because with extra water retention, it has place to really proliferate. This causes puffiness. You may notice it in the morning on your face. The water retention um, can show with bags under the eyes or in the earlobes or just a general kind of doughiness of the face. And this is a sign that there's water retention. One of the possibilities is that the effect of molds or fungi are actively doing this as part of an attack. So if you're sick, this can happen if you've had mold exposure and find that you've had additional water retention or seeming weight gain, that can happen as a result of this as well. Mold toxins can also enter us through food. A scary 25% of consumable commodities globally contain mycotoxins. So specifically your grains, peanuts, coffee, aflatoxin being the nastiest of the bunch because it causes systemic attacks on the body and in particular has effects on the central nervous system. Most of us have these toxins to a varying degree and they influence our ability to function from a cellular level to systemic levels as well. Mold and mold toxins set up shop in your mucus and microbiota. They particularly enjoy your sinuses, lungs, and intestinal lining. They also have indirect effects on the central nervous system via oxygen sensing. As the mold and mycotoxins gravitate toward the mucus in the lungs, they disturb alveolar function. They begin flooding the local tissue to terraform your body. Your own body responds by causing its own mucus to protect itself and these guys are right at home there they love it so your own internal heaven and earth is formed from these gases and microbiota your mouth has a microbiome and so do your sinuses and inside these microclimates there's competition for bacteria and for the gases that sustain the bacteria and the bacteria will release the kind of gases that they need for their children to survive and these Particular types of gases are not always ideal for the body. So the ancient Chinese had this idea that these bugs come in on the wind with this damp and it's considered this sort of wet evil that can get in through the skin and it can get in through foods that you're eating and it will change the gas or qi of the body. So they would call this uh, evil qi, but as we can see, this is definitely causing pathogenic levels of gases, which are beneficial to these types of molds, which do in fact blow in through the wind and are in fact found in both um, toxicity because of spoiled food and because of food retention within the body, causing gut dysbiosis and really creating these harbors for molds and pathogenic fungi. Inside these microclimates, there's this competition. And it's interesting because the endothelial tissue in the nasal sinuses can create one of these gases called nitric oxide. And this is a very important gas. Uh, you can increase it simply by humming. As you hum, or say, om, as many traditions have these kind of uh, vibratory vocalizations, the vibration and blood flow 
causes the endothelial tissue in this area to increase nitric oxide by quite a margin. And this nitric oxide in the right proportion will cause bronchodilation, it will cause increased neural transmission, it will kill bacteria. In the wrong amounts, however, it does quite the opposite. It will cause bronchoconstriction, which will lower the available oxygen levels. It will cause damage to the central nervous system. And it's important to remember that fungi will also use nitric oxide in specific amounts to signal physiological functions such as maturation. The same is true with bacteria and all living things. Every living thing has an interaction with its gaseous environment. This is qi. And there's a preferred gas exchange, which will influence the overall environment and make it hospitable for ourselves and our commensal happy bacterial friends and fungi friends and our microbiome and mycobiome. And there are levels of gas exchange which are only good for pathogens, pathogenic bacteria, fungi, etc. So this is probably why Chris's patient had oxygen levels which had dropped so low. Hypoxia from infection of the alveoli will trigger nitric oxide. In addition, macrophages will get signaled. They kind of chi blast the microorganisms. Nitric oxide serves as a metabolic stand in for oxygen. Lowered oxygen levels will signal its release to maintain heart function. Initially, it will cause the bronchioles to expand because the body wants to get as much oxygen as it can. And this is why jogging can help you feel like your lungs are really open. Initially, you're using up oxygen faster than your body can breathe it in. Nitric oxide goes up. You get that vasodilation, bronchodilation. It feels amazing. That feeling of expansion allows more oxygen to come in. And this is how nitric oxide signaling helps you maintain balance in your body, oxygen and otherwise. There's a sweet spot for nitric oxide and other gasotransmitters to help with neural transmission and maintain appropriate bronchodilation or appropriate levels of other physiological functions in the body. The ideal level for you may not be the same sweet spot for invading pathogens. So they start to mess with the dials via their own gaseous signaling and through molecular mimicry. Now on their own, they're too small to really make a difference. But all of these little guys together, collectively singing the same tune, starts to have effects that can eventually turn the tides and cause cancer or other problems in the body. So at the very least, this would help to explain her hypoxia. In addition, signaling gases and gasotransmitters serve as neurotransmitters. They're neurotransmission via gases. They help intracellular communication at the right levels. At the wrong levels, they shut down intracellular communication. They shut down water pumps. And this is what fungi love to do because once the water pumps are broken down, there are water leaks everywhere and that's how they proliferate. So having deregulated gasotransmitters is associated with epilepsy, seizures, and mental illness. And this is where you get direct effects from the inflammation, direct effects of mycotoxins on the central nervous system itself on the nerves. So all of this we're talking about is still just on the surface level, working with the lungs and the alveolar immune system, alveolar microbiome, the microbiome and the sinuses. Still there are deeper levels. These evil creatures carried on the damp wind with their pathogenic gases can also slip deeper in the body if the host has sufficient mucus built up in the intestines and has high levels of liposaccharides. Diets which are traditionally thought as overly nourishing or damp are now understood to have higher associations with gut dysbiosis and higher levels of liposaccharides. The gut dysbiosis will cause more intestinal permeability and the liposaccharide endotoxins and mycotoxins join forces to terraform the interior of your body to make it soggy, inflamed, and cause your nerves additional stress, and that makes the central nervous system less efficient, and in fact breaks it down. By way of the tight junctions in the intestine being overwhelmed, they get into the bloodstream and proliferate throughout the body.
These liposaccharides are incredibly nasty. They are used to injure tissue in mice studies just to show how effective other drugs or herbs are at treating them. It's a go-to poison. It will predictably cause damage. So many studies I was looking at with Chinese herbs which affect liposaccharides were in fact showing that they were repairing, say, DNA damage caused by liposaccharides because the scientists were using the liposaccharides to cause the damage in the mice. Just to show you how toxic it is, it's being used predictably for mice studies to cause damage. Now, an efficient path to eliminating these liposaccharides and mycotoxins is to hit them together. And this is because they're both kind of nasty and sticky and they leverage each other to maintain a little bit of a foothold. I'm not saying they consciously do that, I'm just saying by their makeup, they're both kind of nasty. So where you find one, you find the other. And interestingly enough, botanicals which eliminate one tend to eliminate the other as well and help to support homeostasis in the gut microbiome. Digestive herbs such as shan cha and shen chu are used with meals. So uh, that's one of the treatments that Valesky had was uh, he had her use MicroGuard Plus, which contains both Shan Jia and Shen Chu. And these work to reduce liposaccharides by establishing healthy gut flora. Shan Jia directly inhibits the mutagenic effects of aflatoxin B1. Shen Chu has shown inhibitory effects on liposaccharide stimulated cytokine production in bone marrow derived dendritic cells. In addition to the MicroGuard Plus, he gave her a second formula, which were Tibetan foot soaks. The volatile oils, terpenes, and alkaloids in this formula are soaked in through the skin. They work to kill pathogenic mold, fungi, and bacteria, dissolving biofilms, and helping to restore healthy microcirculation and nerve growth. Finally, he gave her Botanical Biohacking's Win Tea, composed of Shao Chai Hu and San Ren Tang. This formula is anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and regulates immune factors. The combination of these help to reestablish a healthy gut microbiome, eliminate the mycotoxins and liposaccharides which were holding her down and putting so much stress on her central nervous system. The herbs in MicroGuard Plus and the Tibetan foot soaks both have neurogenic properties. So they're going to help to protect the nerves from inflammation, and they're also going to increase healthy nerve production. So this explains how and why her seizures reduced over time, why this is associated with healthy gut flora and healthy digestion, as well as why her oxygen levels went up. Now, he also mentioned that he was having her do Qigong exercises. The particular Qigong exercise he was having her do was designed to move lymphatic fluid. And this is going to help to eliminate much of the toxicity in the body and help the immune system to be stronger and do its best work. Lymph moves by way of muscular contraction. However, it also moves thanks to our old friend nitric oxide. So by establishing a sweet spot of nitric oxide, which Qigong, Tai Chi, and meditative activities have been shown to do, he was able to help her move that lymphatic fluid and also create an environment within the gut microbiome that helps to be more under control due to its gaseous environment. Now, one of the nice things about exercises like Qigong is they'll get you burping and farting quite a bit as the gaseous environment and the bacteria in the gut begin to terraform and reestablish a cultivated interior, start to cultivate a garden within. So the combination of herbs, foot soaks, and qigong was enough to help this wonderful woman go from a cycle of torment and frustration into getting her life back. As we look into the pharmacology, it's mind-blowing. It really is. You're looking at an ancient concept of wind and damp causing these moldy evils to come in the body and, and find uh, rotting food that hasn't been digested. That's the ancient way of looking at it. And if we look at it from a modern standpoint, we're looking at aflatoxins and liposaccharides, sodium potassium pumps, 
tight junctions in the intestine, gut dysbiosis, we're saying the same thing with different language. And that creates a kind of resonance from ancient times until now. And it allows us deeper insight into so-called untreatable diseases. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I know I did. It's been a blast. If you'd like to find out more, go to botanicalbiohacking.com. We'll have show notes and I'm going to put up uh, the notes I used for this as well as all of the references. There's well of over 20 for this one. Thanks so much for listening to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Miles.